Então, começaremos com a palestra do professor Murray Gray. É, eu vou fazer uma apresentação do professor. É, o professor Murray Gray é vinculado à Escola de Geografia de Queen Mary University of London, bacharelado em Geografia com habilitação subsidiária em Geologia e Meteorologia pela University of Edinburgh, é, PhD pela Universidade of Edinburgh com o tema Glaciação e Mudança Glaciostática do Nível do Mar no Oeste da Escócia, atua há 35 anos com experiência no ensino de graduação dedicado à geomorfologia glacial, geologia do quaternário e geoconservação, mais de 65 cursos de campos, com, campo conduzidos no Reino Unido e em outros países, conferencista convidado de diversas instituições britânicas, tais como a University of Cambridge, examinador externo do Departamento de Geografia, incluindo as universidades de Cambridge e Nottingham. Vamos à nossa apresentação. Well, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, bom dia, bom dia. And uh, obrigado, Flavia, for the introduction. I'm sure it was um, very good. Uh, okay, so I am going to speak about geodiversity, geoheritage, and geoconservation for society. Um, and um, some of this, some of you were at the course I gave uh, the last two days. So, um, but there are quite a lot of, I understand, new people here who weren't at that uh, uh, course. Uh, so some of this, the beginning of this um, presentation will repeat, I'm afraid, some things that many of you will have heard already. But because there are new people, I will, um, I will, I will say some of the things I've already said. But towards the end, I will get on to some new material, um, so, so bear with me. Uh, I'd, okay, so in terms of what I intend to do, I think that uh, as geologists and geomorphologists, we, we haven't always been very good at explaining the value of our subject to society at large. And so what I'm going to try and do today is to um, say what geodiversity is. I know you all, you all already understand that. Um, and then go on to, um, first of all, geodiversity for society using what's known as an ecosystem services approach to describe the way of showing the public uh, and decision makers that we literally couldn't have a modern society without the planet's geodiversity. And then, so first one is about geodiversity for society, and secondly about geoheritage and geoconservation for society, where I'm going to argue Uh, that the public has an interest in ensuring that the planet's geoheritage geo is conserved for future generations. And uh, there'll be a few conclusions at the end. Okay, so um, I, I usually start with this slide because I think the best way to explain what geodiversity is is to start by explaining what geodiversity isn't. And this is a Uh, a sculpture from the institution where I'm associated with, where I spent my career. Uh, it's a, a sculpture called Knowledge, and at the center of this sculpture is a representation of the Earth as a smooth steel sphere. In other words, this is a planet that has no geodiversity. And as I'll explain today, Uh, I think we're very fortunate that we don't have a planet that's like this. In fact, we wouldn't be here if our planet was like this. Okay, so fortunately the world isn't a perfectly smooth uh, sphere composed of a single rock type. It's highly diverse in terms of three things. Uh, it's geological materials, it's topographic variation, it's landforms, and uh, the physical processes operating on the planet. And I usually say to people that if we understand um, value and celebrate, this is what we should be doing, trying to understand, celebrate and value the planet's geodiversity, that can enrich our lives and can enrich the lives of society as well, if we can get this message across. So, for those of you who, who uh, don't know, biodiversity is a well-known term now. It's short for biological diversity 
and it's the variety of living nature, whereas geodiversity, which is short for geological and geomorphological diversity, is a variety of non-living or abiotic nature. And you've got my definition um, uh, uh, at the bottom of that slide. Um, so, in terms of, of geodiversity, we can think in terms of thousands of minerals, hundreds of rock types, millions of fossil species, uh, 19,000 named soil types in the USA alone, 800 in the UK, a huge diversity of processes, fluvial, coastal, glacial, slope aeolian, hydrological, volcanic, and so on, and a huge variation in topography and physical landscape character. Okay, so um, moving on then, the ecosystem services, ecosystem services is a term that's used to um, describe nature's goods and services that benefit society, okay? Ecosystem services, the goods and benefits, uh, the goods and services that benefit society. And this is now the major way uh, in which uh, decision makers and politicians around the world assess the value of nature. Now, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, this was an international effort by about 1,300 scientists around the world to try and classify and describe the ways in which nature benefits society. Um, and what it came up with was a classification into four types, what are called regulating services, supporting services, provisioning services, and cultural services. I'm going, going to now show you the provisioning services that were included in that Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. So here they are. They are uh, food, such as plants and animals. Obviously, society benefits from uh, natural plants and natural animals. Fiber, uh, such as wood, wool, cotton. Fuel, like wood, we burn it. Uh, genetic resources, biochemicals and pharmaceuticals. Ornamental resources, such as shells and flowers. And fresh water. So apart from fresh water, which is abiotic, uh, the rest is all biological. So the problem with the ecosystem services approach, as it's currently used around the world, is that it's biologically dominated. There's no mention in that list that I just showed you of geological resources, such as mineral fuels, building materials, metals, industrial minerals, gemstones, fossils, and so on. But there are also deficiencies in other services. And because of that, because of those deficiencies, I've used the same classification of, of the ecosystem services in the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment to try and, dis, to try and um, uh, outline the goods and services related to geodiversity. But I've also introduced a fifth category, uh, called, which I've called knowledge services, um, which is part of cultural services in the MEA classification because of the importance of geodiversity in providing evidence for the history of planet Earth and the, the history of, of, of life on planet Earth. This is an important aspect that geodiversity has that biodiversity uh, doesn't necessarily have. So I've got about, I've been able to identify about 25 of the major, what we can call abiotic ecosystem services, or sometimes referred to as geosystem services, um, and all of these are the result of the planet's geodiversity. So this is, um, I, I think you probably at the back of the room won't be able to read this slide, but don't worry because I have it in a bigger lettering on another slide. Um, but the important thing about this slide is to demonstrate that everything starts with the geodiversity of our planet. Geodiversity, in turn, leads to what we can call abiotic ecosystem services. And then this splits off into the five categories, regulating services, one to four, supporting services, five to eight, provisioning services, nine to 15, cultural services, 16 to 20, and knowledge services, 21 to 25. So, I've numbered these, I'm going to use these numbers for, as, for examples as we go along. 
so that, that, this is probably a better slide to actually, uh, which uh, I hope is readable from the back. Uh, here we are again, we've got the regulating services, one to four, supporting services, uh, five to eight, provisioning services, nine to 12, uh, sorry, nine to, to 15, cultural services, 16 to 20, and knowledge services, 21 to 25. Um, so I'm going to now give you some case studies and examples. Some of these are taken from geoparks, some are from national parks, some are from world heritage sites, and some are from uh, unprotected um, uh, informal uh, sites as well. And these are simply examples. If you wanted to use this system in your own work uh, with your own residents, for example, or visitors to your geopark, you could include whichever goods and services you think are uh, relevant to, to, your, to your own situation. Um, so I'm going to start with this example, which is uh, of what, what, when I visited, it was an aspiring geopark of Terras de Cavalieros in Portugal. Uh, it's now a fully, uh, now full uh, UNESCO global geopark. Um, and this is a small interpretation center, geological interpretation center, uh, in a small building. But um, it's a, it's a good example of, uh, to explain uh, in a small way how geodiversity uh, can contribute to the construction of a small building. So here is a description of uh, the major things, the major ways in which diversity has contributed to that building. So we've got uh, roof tiles that are clay, plastic gutters, and as you know, plastic comes from oil. Uh, it's got a metal lock handle and lock. It's got plaster walls, it's got stone window surrounds. The window frames themselves are, are, look like wood, but they're actually made of plastic. Uh, and it's got glass in the windows, which as you know, comes from uh, sand. And it's got stone block paving outside. So it's, it's a, a diversity of materials have gone into constructing that building. And it's all abiotic, apart from the tree and the people. Um, so at a larger scale, we have towns and cities like Philadelphia uh, in the United States. And you can see from this, well, no doubt there is some, some wood in these buildings, but by and large, this city and most cities are predominantly made from geological resources which have come out of the, of the ground. And it's a diversity of building materials as well. You know, you can see in these buildings everything from glass, steel, concrete, um, there is bitumen on the, on the roads, um, a, a, and so on. So it's a range of geological materials that goes into building the cities of the world. Uh, this is a particular building. This is a natural history museum in Vienna, in Austria. Uh, there's a photograph of the build, front of the building itself. This is a bigger diagram to show in different colors the different building stones that are used uh, to construct that building. And then these are all described here. It's not quite in focus, but there is uh, the brown, for example, here is slate. Um, and it tells you exactly where this is from. Uh, it's actually from France and from Wales in Great Britain. Um, the, the slate on the, on the roof here. Most of the others are calcareous sandstones, limestone, uh, from various parts of the world. And you can get an explanation of where all the rock types in that building are. So again, diversity from a, of a range of rock types and from a range of places in the world. And um, here we have uh, some of the other ways in which geodiversity contributes to our lives. These are examples of metals and industrial minerals. Um, so we've got, uh, this is a cruise liner, it's actually the Queen, Queen Mary II, um, uh, which is mainly uh, constructed from metal. Uh, here we've got uh, washing machines in a, in a, for sale in a shop. Here we've got a, a, a London bus. And here we've got uh, computer, uh, lap, uh, tablet, and an, an old mobile, an old style mobile phone. So these are all, we use these things every day. Uh, we take them for granted, well the public certainly does, um, but it, sh it ought to uh, be more aware, I think, of the diversity of geological materials 
that society uses in its everyday life. So I said this was an old, old this is an old mobile phone. Of course, we're all, we're all using smartphones now. And I, it's remarkable to me, anyway, that smartphones contain half, about half the non-radioactive elements in the periodic table. I think everyone who owns a smartphone should be made aware of this. And they include um, a number of what are called rare earth elements, such as indium, tantalum, and neodymium. And by definition, because they're rare earth elements, they are rare. So, so, and they're difficult to recycle. It's very difficult to take a mobile phone apart and recycle the material in it. Very small amounts of material, very expensive to do. So um, they, they, they are already rare and they could become scarcer. And some of these uh, elements are only found in certain parts of the world, particularly in China. And so one never knows what political situation may occur in the future and whether these sources of material will still be available uh, into the future. So this could have repercussions for future use of smartphones. Okay, so this, um, I found this on the internet. It's a diagram that shows those elements that are used in uh, smartphones. Uh, you, uh, you probably can't read this at the back. You, well, hopefully you can see the, the elements down each side. But for example, the screen of a smartphone uh, contains a, a material called indium tin oxide. Indium tin oxide. And that is the material that allows the uh, smartphone to operate as a touch screen uh, so that you can scroll and so on. You wouldn't be able to do that without uh, the, ele oh, sorry, the elements of of uh, the elements of indium, tin, and oxygen. Indium tin oxide is very important. Uh, the glass used in the majority of smartphones is an al al aluminal silicate glass. Uh, so it's a mixture of alumina and silica. Uh, so again, al aluminium, silica, oxygen. Uh, the glass also contains potassium ions, which help to strengthen it. So there's potassium. A uh, variety of rare earth elements are used in small quantities to produce the colors in the smartphone's screen. So here we have a range of rare earth elements allowing uh, smartphones to give you color displays. The battery, the majority of phones use lithium ion batteries composed of lithium cobalt oxide. Um, so some batteries use metals such as manganese in place of cobalt, and the battery casing is made of aluminium. So again, that's a range of elements there. Over onto the el electronics, we've got copper used in the wiring. Um, gold, silver are major metals from which microelectrical components are fashioned. Tantalum is a major component of microcapacitors. Nickel is used in the, mi uh, in the microphone. Um, Pure silicon is used in the manufacture of the chip. Tin and lead are used to solder electronics in the phone. Uh, magnesium, and in terms of the casing, you've got magnesium compounds alloyed to make some phone cases. Many are made of plastics uh, uh, and so on. So um, I think that's quite a remarkable diagram that should probably uh, be sold. A copy of that diagram should be sold with every smartphone so that people actually know and understand how they rely, how they rely on the geodiversity of our uh, planet. Geodiversity of the elements of our planet. And these are obviously all come from the, from the geodiversity of the Earth. Okay, number 14 is ornamental products. I don't seem to need to say very much about this, but diamonds, uh, tanzanite, Geolog Gemological Society of America and some examples of um, the way in which um, <coughs> gemstones, precious, precious metals and so on are used in, in jewelry. Uh, food and drink. We, um, I've given you a couple of examples here. This is a, this is, uh, doesn't come out very well, but this is a wine called Grey Wacky um, from New Zealand. It's a Sauvignon Blanc named after the local rock type, grey wacky. And this is a flint wine 
from, it's a Bacchus wine from, from England. It actually uh, was produced uh, just a few kilometers from where I live. So not a lot of people know that England uh, produces wine, but it does. Um, burial and storage. This is a photograph from an English uh, graveyard um, showing that we bury our, our dead uh, often in uh, cemeteries like this. And it also helps to illustrate the range of stones that are used to commemorate the people buried in this um, cemetery. A range of, again, geodiversity of uh, tombstones. Uh, number 18, cultural, spiritual, and historic meanings. This is Mount Fuji in Japan, uh, which is um, sacred to the local um, Buddhist um, society. Like many mountains, as many mountains are, actually. And the Japanese, are, uh, one of the interesting things about the Japanese is that they have an integrated approach to the development of, um, of, of gardens. Uh, so here's an example called from the Golden Temple in Kyoto in Japan. And you can see the integration of stone, uh, uh, plants, and water. So almost all these gardens have got those three elements in, a co in an integrated way, put together as a, as a garden landscape with the temple in the middle. Stone, plants, and water are, are crucial issues of Japanese traditional gardens. And another garden in Japan, in Kyoto, in Japan, is this one, Ryokan Gardens. This is a Zen Buddhist uh, temple. And one of the places in the garden is this amazing um, walled area. This is all, this is gravel, white gravel, which is raked into lines or curving round these stones uh, in this area. Now this goes back centuries, the construction of this garden. Nobody's quite sure what it all means, but it's certainly interesting to the, to the tourists who visit here. You can see the number of tourists looking at gravel and stones. Don't ask me to explain it, but it's a, a geotourist site of, of some uh, importance. Okay, so um, geodiversity also gives us a sense of place uh, in the world. So, I haven't told you where this is, but um, can I, does anybody know where this might be? You know? You've been there. Yes, we were there together last year. <laughs> so, you, anybody else know where it is? Someone who has not been there? Never been there? Where is this? No, you don't know? Oh, <laughs> well, that, that's... Um, that demolishes my theory of sense of place because it's uh, Table Mountain in uh, Cape Town in South Africa. And I was hoping that you would all say, ah, it's, okay. it's Table Mountain. <laughs> um, but um, uh, if we think in a Brazilian context, if I showed uh, a photograph of um, Rio de Janeiro to an English audience, I think they would say, oh, that's Rio de Janeiro because it, it, been on the on the television, on the Olympics and the World Cup. And so the World Cup was here, actually. The previous one was in South Africa. So, um, But the, the point is that this is a very distinctive uh, topography. Uh, and um, so it helps to you to place where you are in the world. It gives the world a sense of place, the diversity of topography in the world, the difference between uh, Cape Town in uh, Table Mountain in Cape Town and the um, Sugarloaf in Rio de Janeiro. Okay, number 19 is artistic inspiration. Artists are inspired to create uh, music from the quality of landscapes. Um, sculpture, sculptors uh, create artworks from stone and other materials. Um, artists paint landscapes which uh, are, inspire them to, to, to write. Poets compose poems about uh, landscapes as well. 
So this is an example from uh, uh, Canada of um, uh, sculptures in, in stone. Uh, here's an example, oops, sorry. Here's an example from Scotland. These are uh, quite um, fantastic features, I think. There are people down here, so these, these are uh, people. So these are very large um, sculptures of horses, called the Kelpies, um, but they're put together through stainless steel uh, metal. And so, again, artists inspired to use geological materials to create um, sculptures and other features. And fossils can also be, be, be art. Um, this was an exhibition in, uh, in Oslo a few years ago um, called Fossil Art. And so some of these are trace, trace fossils. Um, this is a shrimp. Uh, burrow uh, and so on. Um, so all of these have been put together. This exhibition was put together by uh, this guy, Dolph Do uh, Schellecker, a German, um, with, who goes around the world taking casts of uh, fossil sites that he believes are artistically uh, uh, interesting. Uh, number six is habitat provision. The physical world, the geodiversity of the earth um, gives us a basis or gives uh, plants and animals uh, uh, different places in which they can survive. It gives them their habitats, yeah? So here's an example from South Africa on the left of plants growing along a crack in the granite rocks in that area. So the, the plants have got a foothold in that place. This is in the Algarve in Portugal where barnacles are cover, have covered this particular set of rock outcrops uh, in the tidal zone of that particular area. So uh, life forms uh, depend on suitable habitats in which to live. So without geodiversity, you would have very little biodiversity in the world. The two things are interlinked. Number 17 is ge geotourism and leisure. There's an example of some uh, coastal sea stacks in, uh, in Canada. This is actually in the Bay of Fundy. Uh, in Canada, on e in eastern Canada, it's actually the place that's got the biggest tidal range in the world. It's something like 50, 15 meters from low tide to high tide. So a tremendous uh, tidal range in that area. And the reason for that is its topographic um, characteristic. Uh, 16 environmental quality landscapes like this are important to society because they... Um, they are an, an escape, if you like, for, for many people from their urban environment. Uh, number two is terrestrial processes. This is a river in, in England. It's, what it's doing is draining water uh, from the catchment area and getting that water off the land and into the sea and a part of the hydrological cycle. And number five is soil as a growing medium. Here we've got an olive grove in Portugal. And here also in Portugal is the old way in which olive oil used to be produced. There was a, a, a donkey, I think, or a, a attached to this. And as it, as it moved round, these, stone, uh, these stones crushed the, the olives. So this is how olive oil used to be produced. So it's partly historical, of historical interest as well. And finally, history of research. This is a place called... Hutton's Unconformity, um, which is 21 and 22, because it's important in the history of research, because it was here that James Hutton in the 18th century worked out from this particular slide that the earth must be much older than the, the believed at the time, which was only about 6,000 years old. He realized that to get this situation, these, these beds uh, of uh, sandstone and shale and greywacky, must have been laid down horizontally, and somehow they've been up-tilted, put down below the waves, you've had other material put on top. So he said, this must be take longer than 6,000 years to do. So he was the first person to work out that um, uh, most people at the time thought the world no older than a few thousand years. Hutton realized that earth processes are cyclical, and that geological time is virtually unlimited. Okay, moving on. 
uh, to geoheritage and geoconservation for society. This is what I've called the geoconservation um, equation. What I've said, what I've explained, I hope, is that geodiversity creates many values for society, but it can also be threatened by human actions, such as engineering projects. So if something is of value but threatened, then it creates a need for conservation. So geoconservation is essential in order to protect geosites, natural landscapes, and physical processes. I'm sure we all would agree with that statement. But does society agree? I realize we are, we are all part of society, but does it, uh, would it agree as, as a society? Okay, here are some definitions of geoheritage, which are those parts of the planet's geodiversity that may be specifically identified as having geoconservation significance. So geoheritage is part of geodiversity. And geoconservation is the action taken with the intent of conserving and enhancing geological and geomorphological features, processes, sites, and specimens. So here, this is the diagram that shows you geoheritage up here. This is, the whole, thing, the whole diagram is the total geodiversity of the Earth. Uh, geoheritage is that bit there, which is, um, can be, uh, the, this, this is a dashed line, because it can move down through either restoration or geoconservation decisions, or it can be lost by um, human, uh, human activity. I don't have time to explain this diagram in full, or indeed the next one. Okay, let me um, move on to some examples. This is a case study from the Berlin Gap. It's a protected site. It's a, a legally protected site, a site of special scientific interest in the UK. It's on the south coast of England. It's composed of Cretaceous chalk uh, in these cliffs. It's got a meter or two above it of quaternary periglacial valley sediments because this is actually in a slight valley. Uh, and these are actively eroding cliffs, uh, as you can see. And the, the beach, the, the, the chalk, has uh, layers of flint uh, within it, and the chalk tends to be dissolved, whereas the flint the particles are left uh, on the beach. So this is mainly a flint uh, beach, flint uh, particle, flint uh, uh, shingle beach. Okay, so as you can see from this uh, diagram, here we have some, a terrace of houses which used to be symmetrical. You can see on the end here a chimney and a sloping roof. There used to be a similar thing on this end, but because it was so close to the cliff, it's been demolished. And can you all see that that's the case? And obviously if the cliff continues to erode, these other houses will disappear into the sea. So, residents couldn't, residents obviously of these houses didn't want their houses to fall into the sea. So they tried to lobby the local authorities to, to protect the coast. The authorities wouldn't, wouldn't do that. Uh, so they submitted their own planning application to build a protective revetment of boulders at the foot of the cliff. The local authority refused planning permission for that uh, construction. Uh, they refused it because they said it would be detrimental to the site of special scientific interest and detrimental to scenic quality. The residents appealed and a public inquiry was held in 2000. The residents argued that these are scientists blocking protection of our homes. That was their main uh, argument, that scientists, those people over there, are blocking protection of our homes. Um, English Nature, which is a government, which at the time was a government uh, organization responsible for nature conservation in England, uh, argued that continued erosion of the cliffs was important at this, that at this protected site. Firstly, to maintain beach supply material, we need to supp keep supplying flint to the beach, otherwise it gets denuded. Retain the cliff exposures in the chalk and the periglacial stratigraphy, and conserve the coastal scenery. So there was a public inquiry. The inspector who ran the inquiry agreed with English nature. And what he said was that 
site of special scientific interest status, uh, he said that is important, not just for scientists, because designations reflect the national importance of the site. Such designations are underpinned by legislation. Legislation comes from the government and, and from local policies. And that is an important decision that emphasizes that geoheritage is important for society and that conservation legislation and policy are authorized by the public, by society, through decisions made by their elected representatives. In other words, the public elects politicians to make decisions on their behalf, and these sites are protected by legislation made by uh, uh, democratically elected politicians. Now, I realize that in every country of the world, we don't have democratically elected politicians, but in many countries we do. Okay, I think I'll skip Eastern Bavins because I did talk about that um, uh, a few years ago. I'm going to move on now to Donald Trump. How Donald Trump getting involved in protecting, what's Donald Trump's approach to geoconservation? Well, in 2006, uh, this is a Trump International Golf Course Scotland, which is one of his company, or was one of his companies. I'm sure he's passed it on to his children now. But it was one of his countries, uh, companies. He applied for planning permission to build two co golf courses on the coast of eastern Scotland, a place called Many House. Uh, one was to be a championship course that would take up the southern third of a site of special scientific interest, which is a coastal sand dune area uh, near Aberdeen. Uh, the proposal, as well as those two golf courses, he wanted to build a clubhouse, driving range, 450 room resort hotel on eight floors, conference center, spa, 950 holiday apartments in four blocks, 36 golf villas, 500 houses, accommodation for 400 staff, new access, gatehouse, roads and car parks, okay? So not a small development in a site of, uh, some of it being in a site of special scientific interest, protected because of its geomorphology, sand dunes. Um, so the local council um, considered it at two meetings of Aberdeenshire Council, but it, actually, it ended up being called in by the Scottish Government and there was a four-week public inquiry held in 2008. Objectors included this organisation, Scottish Natural Heritage, which is the uh, government organisation in Scotland responsible for nature conservation. They were concerned that the active sand sheets and dune system would be affected by excavations and stabilisation measures. So these are actively moving sand dunes, dynamic, this is a dynamic landscape. And they suggested a compromise. They suggested moving the championship course away from the impo most important part of the site of special scientific interest, okay? So they said, no, we're not opposed to a golf course, just don't build it on the most sensitive part of this particular site of special scientific interest. What did Donald Trump say? Oh, sorry, there's a, a slide showing the area, and you can see the active sand dunes here, uh, and also in the distance. Donald Trump himself, this is before he was president, obviously, gave evidence at that public inquiry. He stated, oh sorry, he stated that if the championship course was moved away from the site of special scientific interest, it would no longer be the truly great course he intended, since it would not include the most spectacular high dune system. And he said that if he was refused permission, he would withdraw the project and the area would lose out on that investment. The, it went to public inquiry. The planning inspectors concluded that much, though not all, of the geomorphological interest in that area uh, would be compromised, as would its overall integrity. The loss of this dynamism cannot be mitigated against, he said. This is the inspector at the public inquiry. But the overall conclusion was that the, the adver adverse effects created by this golf course were, would be outweighed by the social and economic benefits that were of national significance. The Scottish Government agreed. The project was given consent. The golf course has been built. Due to the recession, the other buildings haven't been constructed yet. 
Uh, oops, uh, Jonathan Hughes, who is uh, from the Scottish, uh, Scottish Wildlife Trust, uh, says that this sends a dangerous message that pr these protected sites could be up for grabs if you write a big enough check. So that's a case of where the environmental impacts on a geomorphological triple SI were outweighed by economic and social ones. Um, I am running out of time, I'm afraid. So I shall just skip to one or two other examples. Here is a Japanese natural monument. It's uh, a 4,000 year old scoria cone. Uh, you, there, there is a, a, a chairlift to the top. You can walk around this uh, cone. There's a footpath around the, the crater rim. Um, but this is a natural monument Mount Omuru, designated by the national government. But what this is telling the public is that it's your government that has protected this, and so it's part of your heritage. South African National Parks. This is taken from their website, South African National Parks website, A to Z of South African National Parks. And the wording here is important. What it's saying to the public, the South African public, is that this is your natural heritage. It's not the government's natural heritage, yeah? It's not politicians' natural heritage. It's the public's national heritage. It's natural heritage for society, in other words. And here again is a, a leaflet that produced for the West Coast National Park that says, um, South African National Park, your natural heritage. It's got quite important um, geosites uh, in, in, in that particular National Park. Also in South Africa, not far away, is what's called the West Coast Fossil Park. It's a Miocene site with Miocene vertebrate fossils in an excavation here. Um, and they've just built, it wasn't actually open when we went there last year, uh, it's a huge visitor center, um, interpretative center, and you'll see up here it's funded by the South African National Lottery. In other words, here is public money, people giving money to construct a geological interpretation center. So again, this is ge geology, geological conservation for society. Uh, in terms of geoparks, uh, this one is in Greece. It's a fossilized petrified tree, 20 million year old, buried by ash and pyroclastic layers. Global geoparks, as many of you will know, have three aims, conservation of geoheritage, geological education for the public, and sustainable economic development. And uh, uh, what I've, I've described this as follows, that the aim of geoparks, global geoparks, is to allow local communities, in other words, local society, to take ownership of their geological and other heritage by protecting it, promoting it, and by doing so, gaining some sustainable economic benefit from it. So there's no doubt that global geopark, the global geopark uh, concept is about geoconservation and education for society. And similarly, I'll uh, skip uh, 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 on to world heritage sites are, have to be of outstanding universal value and this is a take, this, these are some quotes taken from the operational guidelines for the implementation of that World Heritage Convention. Sites should have significance that is so exceptional as to transcend national boundaries and to be of common importance for present and future generations of all humanity. In other words, World Heritage Sites are for the, the population of the world, for, for the world society. These are important not just for each nation, where they occur, but for the world community as a whole. As such, the permanent protection of this heritage is of the highest importance to the international community as a whole. So there couldn't be a clearer um, explanation of why world heritage is important to society. Uh, just an example of the South China Karst World Heritage Site, and another one here, uh, from the Grand Canyon. These are very important places in the world for geoconservation. So in conclusion, our planet has an incredible and magnificent geodiversity that ought to be understood and celebrated because quite simply, 
our modern society today couldn't live without geodiversity. And geoconservation of geoheritage is important because it protects the evidence for Earth history, the evolution of life, and local paleoenvironments. So it's important to society that, we, that society knows how the Earth was formed, how it's evolved through time, how we got to our present position, how life evolved into what we see today. And that's done, geoconservation is supported and funded by society through international, national and local legislation and policy passed by elected representatives in many places. It's done by public funding and it's done by local geoconservation initiatives on the ground, including educational ones. Okay, thank you for listening. Obrigado. If you want to read more, then I have written a book. <laughs> thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much for the excellent presentation. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time to questions because we need to continue the presentation. Thank you.